Hi everyone, I'm Sin from Art Science Museum. Thank you for joining us this evening for the live stream artist talk for Art Science Lead at Home. This is the museum's performance strand and it forms part of Art Science at Home, which is the broader suite of programs that have found a new home on our online platforms over the last eight months. Art Science at Home has marked a new expression for how we connect and engage with our audiences and the broader community during this period. It is a significant part of our work in which we continue to nurture new forms of invention in different kinds of space. We like to think of the Art Science Laid at Home performance series as a court progression from the monthly in-person performances that we have been presenting in our gallery since 2014. During this period, we have been inviting artists to respond to the context of the pandemic with short performance pieces developed for the online platform. They're very much making use of video as a tool and improvising with what is available in their environments to create these intimate encounters to share with you. Across the last eight months, we have listened in as Sarah Wong delivered a performance of sung and spoken word in the intimacy of his bedroom accompanied only by wind chimes, joined Tim Dakota in thinking about the new normal as we sat with this new single created in lockdown. Tuned out with King Leon's ambient set played from his living room to embrace a moment of quietude. Contemplated breath, life and hope with Adele Goh's solo dance piece. Listened in to David Finnegan telling the story of the bushfire crisis engulfing his hometown of Canberra, set against the changes taking place on our planet from the deep past to the present day and brooded in sound delirium with Fox as he drew the textures of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari over us. This month, as the concluding iteration of Art Science Late at Home for this year, we are delighted and incredibly privileged to present the works of Tanya Di Rosario, Marilyn Tan and Natalie Wang in a program of spoken word that gives voice, shape and depth to the contemporary female experience in Psyche. Their works illuminate what is hidden in the margins and portray the unique experiences of what it means to be a woman today, bringing us into the space where their defined, uncom uncompromising women exist. The performance works premiered earlier today on Art Science Museum's YouTube channel and will continue to be available for viewing as part of the programs we have been building for Art Science, Art Science at Home. This evening, we are joined by Natalie Wang and Marilyn Tan for a live stream Q&A to talk about their practice, how they have translated their writings into a performative encounter, and how we make room for an expansive understanding of the variety of ways women show up across different intersections of their identity. So a short introduction of our guest artists before we start. Natalie writes about cats, ghosts, and womanhood, and maintains that they are all the same thing. Her debut poetry collection, The Woman Who Turned Into a Vending Machine, published by Math Paper Press, is a book on metamorphosis and myth. She's been published widely, um, included in My Lot is a Sky, an anthology of poetry by Asian women. Marilyn describes herself as queer, female, Chinese Singaporeans, linguistics graduate, poet and artist, who has been performing and disappointing since 2014. Her work trades in the conventionally vulgar, radically pleasurable and unsanctioned, striving to emancipate the marginalized and restore the alienated and injured body. Marilyn is the first woman to win the Singapore Literature Prize for Poetry in English with her first volume of Poetry Gaze Back, published by Ethos Books, and is also the founder of arts collective Discontent. We are live streaming on YouTube. Uh, YouTube and Facebook this evening and would love to hear from you throughout the session. So please do share your thoughts or any questions that you might have for Marilyn and Natalie in the chat boxes. We were actually hoping to be joined by Tanya De Rosario as well, but it's 5 a.m. where she is currently based and the time difference makes it slightly challenging to have her with us today. But it gives me great pleasure at this point welcoming Marilyn and Natalie into the room. Hello, Marilyn Hi. and Natalie. Hi. Hello. Hi. Thank you so Hi. much for making time to join us as um, guests for this live stream conversation. Thank I wonder you. if we could start by having both of you share a little bit about yourself and your practice um, with everyone who's joining us this evening. Shall we go with, um, perhaps Natalie, you can start first. All right. 
Um, I I don't really know how to describe my practice except uh, at one point, I think when I first started writing out poetry, it was a lot of very typical like, uh, no, I'm going to die alone kind of poetry. And then at one point, I think I uh, someone called me the Taylor Swift of poetry because I kept writing breakup poetry. And I was like, hmm, let's try something different. And then that's, I think, when I started going back into um, prose poetry, into a lot of myth, fairy tale. And that was mm -hmm. how I eventually ended up with the collection in my book. But I think it, the the more confessional love poetry still remains in that collection as well. So it's not just um, myth, it's not just weird stuff happening. And then now uh, I'm moving more towards horror actually for the last couple of years, uh, but uh, mostly to do with body horror, um, but somehow still very, very different from Marilyn's kind of body horror somehow. Um, and then now, I, I don't know, like my the, the work that is shared with Art Science Museum, um, Lena at Home is very, it's actually really different from what I've been writing for the last few years in that it's very That's sentimental. True which yeah. is something I have been running away from. <laughs> yeah. I would love to ask you the texture of that poem too that you presented for Art Science Late at Home. Um, but Marilyn, if we could just go to you for a minute and talk about your story. Um, I read that you feel like you've always written poetry and then when you were young, your father would give you assignments during the holidays and say things like, oh, why don't you write one poem a day? So um, is that why you... you is that when you started writing or was there another sort of pivotal moment that made you set off on this path? Um, yeah, I I mean, I, I feel like it really did start with that because prior to that, I didn't even know what a poem... Wait, that's not true. Okay, so my my parents would buy me books, right? So they're, they're responsible for my book habit. Um, and I guess uh, because I read so much what goes in must come out, right? So I would... Um, proceed to write little short stories or little snippets of whatever. And I think one thing that a, a, po a book of poetry that was very dear to me was like the little book of dog poetry that my parents bought for me. Uh, and it was, it was like kind of marrying two of my interests, right? Reading and dogs. And um, yeah, I, I think that because my father encouraged me encouraged me and asked me to write a poem a day and would give me feedback on it that that dopamine is like kind of hard to beat you know when you're six years old wow that young yeah like in, in primary school when you have um, right. June or December holidays you know you'll you ah <laughs> The Asian parenting stuff. Uh, let's let's <laughs> wait for Marilyn to come back. It happens. Um, yeah, I mean, Natalie, why why poetry as opposed to another form? Um, so poetry, I think started. I think a lot of people uh, I know who started writing poetry started in JC when you study lit, and that's formally uh, introduced as a compulsory part of um, literature. But previously in secondary school, you're my teacher used to be like, oh, don't pick the unseen poem, don't pick the unseen poem, just pick unseen prose kind of a thing. Uh, and then you just didn't have time because I used to write like long, long pieces of prose and fan fiction when I was in secondary school and you just didn't have time for that in JC. Mm -hmm. And then um, I stopped for a while, then I started going to open mics and I was like, oh, poetry can be like this. Like it's not just, um, you know, like metaphor, 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 like very, something that you had to read over six times to think that you maybe grasp, like scratch the surface of its like meaning. Uh, it could be direct, it could be performative, it could be, uh, and there were so many different ways of doing it. And I love the way, uh, especially like if people started incorporating either music or uh, mm -hmm. their own um, um, specific kinds of like cultural art styles or things like that uh, with it. And uh, like I, I, in Scotland, I, I once heard someone perform poetry, but like with, with very much of Scottish types of like rhyme and slang that was in it, for mm. example. And that was just wonderful to hear. And um, definitely in Singapore, Malaysia, we have a quite, I think, a rich um, tradition of um, going with uh, music, with uh, Singlish, with uh, Malay, uh, um, like kind of like rhythm and that kind of thing. And mm. uh, yeah, I've, I've gone back to writing a bit of prose on the side, uh, nothing very publishable, but definitely like for me, poetry remains one of those mediums where unlike an essay 
you don't have to give a definitive answer or conclusion. I find it's very good for expressing um, the ineffable. So usually it's when like, like I'm trying to describe something I can't, I don't have a word for, yeah. Uh, what about you, Marilyn? Why poetry as opposed to another form? Well, the short answer is I'm lazy. The long answer is because uh, I started writing, I think I stopped writing poetry from the ages of, uh, I think, 15 to about maybe 17 or so, because I didn't get into the creative arts program and all my friends did. And I felt very upset about this. So like creative, the creative arts program is um, a program that's offered to secondary schools and uh, junior colleges in Singapore, where, you know, we kind of, are given the opportunity to be in the presence of other, other, um, I guess, young writers, and you have to apply, right? So um, I felt like, you know, I, I wasn't good at poetry, and like my kind of poetry wasn't like um, it wasn't acceptable. So, um, and then after that, I tried again, and then I got in, and then uh, you know, it it kind of dawned on me that it's, it's, it's really a very subjective art form. And it was the one place where I could go to say something that um, you couldn't really criticize, you know, like, I mean, you can, you know, you can, you can definitely say it's a bad poem, but it's something that I felt like I had more ownership over rather than other forms of art, like mm. um, drawing, for example, where you, you know, if something's out of proportion, it's out of proportion, you can see it, you know? Mm. Poetry at, at the same time felt very more opaque to me and more, um, I guess, malleable in terms of mm. technicality and in terms of artistry. Um, and for somebody with like close to zero um, art training, that was uh, sort of like a life, uh, a lifeline. Wow, that's really interesting to hear. Um, how would you describe yourself as a writer then? Uh, very promiscuous, very multidisciplinary, very, um, I think I borrow a lot from very different sources. I, I think I learned how to do things like wordplay or, you know, like uh, euphemism from the work of musicians like the Bloodhound Gang or uh, Amanda Palmer, for example. So it wasn't poetry at all. You know, I don't, read poetry i didn't read poetry until i was like maybe 16 or so so everything i read up till then was horror everything i listened to was very inappropriate songs on the internet so like all of these <laughs> yeah all of these like extremely um multifarious sources kind of came together and they churned out this very i guess sort of like um unorthodox poetry that i didn't really see anybody else doing mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, to this day, I still say I hate reading poetry because most of what people think of as poetry is banal and like it's it appeals to a certain uh, pleasantry that I I find myself having no patience for. You know, I'm just, mm -hmm. just a very impatient person. So, well, what about you, Natalie? How would you describe yourself as a poetess or a writer? Um. I actually haven't thought of myself as a writer in a while. Um, because, no, because um, I've been so taken up with my day job in the last couple of years mm -hmm. that um, like I'll vomit out a lot of poems during Singapore Poetry Writing Month in April. And uh, yeah, I'll clean that up over the year and I'll submit it every once in a while. But like I, my output in 2019 was so bad. Like I, I barely wrote anything given, and I wrote a lot in 2018. And this year has been like panic <laughs> because you know pandemic and everything. Um, and I actually went back to writing a lot of fan fiction and um, so prose because I keep telling myself, you know, this is going to be training because I've not learned how to sustain writing something for an extended period of time. And then I was like, okay, it's easier to do it if I don't have to think so much about world building or I don't have to think so much about whatever the characters are there. Just just come up with a plot right and uh, move that plot realistically along so uh, I'm training myself now I think I'm, I feel like I'm a training wheels now until I will finally get around to it but like right now what I'm trying to really focus on is um, world building uh, I am drawn a lot actually in the last five years or so from like things like video games like I like the really immersive kinds that have got very good lore um, that that uh, 
not necessarily always just make you think, but also don't give you an easy answer to what is going on. So like um, for those people who are tuning in, listening like from softwares like Bloodborne, Sekiro um, are like fantastic examples, I think of like uh, obscure kinds of storytelling, but everything is so immersive because of the 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 music, the atmosphere, the um, how beautifully every the, the entire like background is put out. And only if you look into details of things, like even from like armor that different kinds of people wear, then you can piece out kind of like a timeline or um, different characteristics of like how somebody comes from somewhere or something like that. And and the way um, beautiful script writing then is built into that to create to be part of that world is. Um, yeah, like it's just an entire experience which I really like. Yeah. I mean, talking about output and how difficult sometimes that can be, um, what are both of your writing processes like then? Um, I get itchy to write a poem when I I guess I think of a certain metaphor or I I think about, you know, juxtaposing two very different concepts that Kind of tickle my pickle, you know. So when I when I get, uh, for example, the there's this uh poem that I always read from Gaze Back. It's called "Cursing the Fig Tree," and it's about Jesus Christ as a teenage girl. And you know, when I when I got that metaphor, it was kind of like, oh, this is a gift, you know. Like you, there are so many things you can do with it. You can just just play with it all the whole time. Um, and I think the most recent thing I saw that made me itchy to write a poem was um. A story about um, oh I don't know if I should say this but uh, it, it was basically somebody uh, almost dying from pleasuring themselves in a very unhealthy way to do with maggots and dumpsters so you know it, it kind of made me like oh this is so disgusting I have to write something about it you know so I think that's that's where um, that's generally how my process percolates and then I do research and then I kind of like get the the nitty-gritty details from the nitty-gritty metaphors from the details itself from the research detail um, what about you Natalie um, these days it's very much driven by um okay so for poetry it would usually be a specific sensation or an emotion that i'm trying to capture that again i just don't have the words for it right and i'm trying to take someone on that journey or i'm trying to explain to myself what said feeling might be like because i'm i'm very emotionally um stunted that way like i need to explain it myself i can't identify it otherwise um yeah so that's for poetry but for um prose now i think a lot of it is i'm going with a lot of themes like i'm trying like i'm trying to write something now about miscommunication and um the inability to be honest about your own feelings and how that creates uh well miscommunication and um and just like unhealthy sorts of relationships just because someone refuses to be like or a couple of parties refuse to be honest and um yeah i'm trying to i still haven't figured out the ending like i wanted to be happy but i don't know how to get there um but but that like yeah it's usually it's fixated around as a very specific story i want to tell or there's a ongoing pokemon fan fiction of all things that i'm writing that is over a hundred thousand words long now you know you have to drop <laughs> telling- your your, uh, yeah, I know I have to drop my age. Yeah. Point, but like, like basically, I wanted to write a story about um, growing up and going back to your home and realizing that everything that you thought about it was safe was only safe because people were hiding things from you. And now you have to go basically like grow up and realize how the world is a lot more complicated than you thought it was growing up. And um, dealing with that as well as dealing with loss dealing with the idea of dreams and ambitions not working out uh and and yeah so yeah when you're writing whether it's fan fiction whether it's poetry whether it's prose or anything that is not quite defined by you know the usual parameters do you think about who you're writing for for both of you um it is do you write for yourself or do you imagine that the work would exist in the public domain hence you know you're writing for the eyes of someone else 
Yes, uh, I I feel like I think about it too much actually. So like I have, <laughs> I have um. So I I I wrote Gaze Back in conjunction with a mentor, Divya Victor, right? Uh, because I started it as a research writing project, and one of the biggest questions I had for her was, how do I how do I make this accessible without catering to the lowest common denominator? Because, you know, mm. like you can't please everybody, right? And nor, nor should you want to. And then the first thing she did was she sent me this thing about pandering, right? Like against pandering. Mm. Uh, and the second thing she said to me was, you know, you, you have to imagine your audience, you have to fantasize your audience, right? And that's what I do now. I fantasize my audience. And unfortunately, or fortunately, my audience it's me. It just looks like me. <laughs> so, so it's like, um, so that gives me a lot of freedom because it's like, if you don't like it, I'm sorry, but it wasn't, I guess it wasn't written for you then, you know, then it's, it's my rating. I don't know if that's the same for you, Nat. Um, I want to say that I write for myself, but it's deeply untrue because I like, <laughs> I feel like for temperature. I take screenshots and I send it to all my friends and be like, scream about this so you can enjoy this writing process with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and this your screams will will keep, give me the strength to keep going. That's helpful for um wow. long form. I think I if I ever write a novel, I will need like a support group of at least like ten people, and like I will send you all weekly updates on WhatsApp or Telegram or something like that, and be like, tell me to keep writing and like be excited because I can't be excited. Um, for poetry, and I think this was um, briefly touched on, I think, in, I can't remember a discussion. Ah, yes, I had this discussion with you, Marilyn, as I had with lots of people, um, that, that um, I think I, sh I went away from confessional poetry, and I don't think I'm going back for a while, because um, I'm, I'm just so perturbed with how um, people, like, because it's confession, they assume everything must be true or they they um assume that uh they know you as a result of your writing or they make assumptions or yeah i mean marilyn's advice to me was great it was just like that's not like a them problem not a you problem why should they stop you from writing and while that's great like yeah like um i i still wear shy <laughs> um i don't like I had a bit of a shock when I went back to my book a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, and I was just like, oh, here are people I have forgotten that I wrote this poem about or something like that. And um yeah. Um, yeah, so on the topic of intimacy, I was reading one of your recent blog entries, Natalie. Um, and you mentioned in, in the entry that you have been thinking a lot or struggling, you know, a lot about the idea of intimacy within poetry and, you know, how much to allow readers to interpret from your poems, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering whether that was something that had factored into the writing of or the filming of um, Dear Love, I'm thinking about you during this difficult time, um, the work that you have oh, presented. Yeah. Have presented for Art Science Slate at home and um, I'll get to Marilyn's work in just a second but I'm really interested to, to hear about that from you because you know it kind of came out at around the same time so I'm just wondering whether that correlated yeah. in any yeah. way. Uh, so I, I have image, I have very very strong uh, image control issues like I, I don't I really don't like the idea of people seeing me or treating me in ways that I did not deliberately set myself or present myself to be in and that's impossible to control right like and I'm still trying to live with the fact it's completely impossible so I think um like I mean initially the 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 first poem that we were discussing like my first idea when I floated to you on what I wanted to do I was saying oh I wanted to play with the idea of um, dress, of makeup, and that kind of thing, which I really am interested in. And I, it would have been a, a more fantasy-oriented poem uh, and mm -hmm. Chinese-oriented poem rather than, than something that uh, comes off as so confessional. And like I can tell mm -hmm. you the entire time I was filming it, I was freaking out and I was like, why did I do this to myself? Why am I subjecting this to myself? When I had to, you know, obviously play it over and over again to edit it, I was just like, no, because there are so many ways that this can be interpreted or assumed, especially if it's people that I know or people who know vaguely about my life. And then um, 
and and I was I, I was trying to tell myself that this is a project that I'm forcing myself to, to to do, even if I am uncomfortable with it, because um, I'm tired of letting this I guess fear of loss of control stopping me from writing or presenting or reading what I want in public events, and um, and and I guess uh, like. I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm also very, I'm very, not concerned, but I'm, I, I really don't like this idea of um, the, and I see it as a, a next step of um, the way we're trying to commercialize like uh, authenticity. And then now the new, the new buzzword is now intimacy. And I get that people want to feel connected during the pandemic, but I, um, but it's a word that's just been buzz it around so much as like actors do all sorts of like filming and stuff like that in their homes i'm just like but what you're still seeing is obviously still a presentation of what they chose to give i mm -hmm. don't like the idea of being forced to have to make it seem that you know i'm, I'm burying my soul even though like this is being filmed in my bedroom you know like it's like why is it less of a presentation as opposed to if this was professionally done in a studio or a stage somewhere yeah yeah, I was I was going to ask you exactly about that because we um, had talked about your initial idea about reading painted skin from you know your first collection of poetry and um, at that point in time it seemed like a very exciting invitation to explore um, performative femininity and um, then you also mentioned that you thought about reading something from your set of what you call your angry woman poems um, okay. and, and I was going to ask you about what made you pivot and decide on. I'm doing dear love. I'm thinking of you during this difficult time eventually. So, yeah. so it's really nice to, to hear that you you are tackling something that you've been struggling with a lot um, straight on. And um, it's it's got such a beautiful, distinct texture from your other writings that that you know yeah. I've come across. Um, and and the part where you spoke about this piece um, relating, you know, directly to your experience of the current moment is is just it's just really moving for me as I was telling Marilyn. Um, it's it's got a resilience and its vulnerability and and I was and, and yeah, it, it's it's something that you know it, it really stayed with you and I, I guess that really worked. Um, and I'd love to talk to you, Marilyn, about your work. Um, it was it was re I remember it was really lovely getting um, your update that you were going to present three poems because we talked about you kind of reading one and then um, you know you, you you said okay I'm gonna do a triptych um, so there's Blake's name Delilah and um, the Z colon black backslash uses backslash Marilyn dot Tan backslash undocuments backslash queer bodies I made it through the title from your book <laughs> um, yeah. and deprivation and sucker which is um, a new um, unpublished poem that's written as a response to Latha's collection of stories, um, the goddesses in the living room. Um, could you talk to us about the selection of poems for you know um, this this um, performance piece? Okay, um, so I realized that if I was going to do just one poem, it would be first of all very short, and second of all, I wanted to. I don't think it was sort of representative of you know all the things I was interested in talking about in terms mm -hmm. of women's experiences, which is what the poem was, right? Um, and I was quite interested in thinking about poetry as a transcendent thing, right? So which is why, you know, I I, I kind of did that that weird, you know, the, the video thing with like the aesthetics of the video if you watch it. Um oh, it's so trippy. It's very <laughs> uh yeah, I guess like what I was going for was tender brutalness, tender brutality, you know? So um and I think that the very lo-fi quality of the video kind of and, and the and the audio of course because I need a sound engineer, but also because like I leaned into the aesthetic of it, um, was such that all of these poems actually are invested in the idea that to be woman or to be to exist in a body is to be both divine and um decrepit you know like uh, um both uh, the you know both the transcendent and the completely filthy they're um they're intertwined and i i find power in the idea that women can be ugly and powerful you know that's always been my thing and um it's like how do I put this? It's 
I chose all of these poems because they each represented, um, I guess, different parts of my horror or different parts of my anxieties with regards to being a woman. Like, for example, Deprivation and Sucker was very much written from the idea that, you know, someone could be very good at being a woman and um, still be subjected to patriarchal violence or still be subjected mm. to like, like this mundane life in the kitchen, you know, like, chopping up fish and basically being a good wife and for what for what you know like for for the banal the banality of a nuclear family i don't know anyway um and i think blade's name delilah was also like um pivoting to another extreme right being horrified at the body itself that you find yourself in you know like the body of a hairy woman or the the body that you have to pinch and poke and pluck to kind of police into becoming an acceptable quality of, of feminine that um, is respectable, right? And uh, I mean, that also kind of ties into Natalie's obsession with ghosts and um, and the paranormal because, you know, I, I use the idea of Asian ghosts as um, ways in which to talk about these anxieties surrounding hair, right? Uh, and body hair, especially. Um, and of course, the code poem C colon backslash blah 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 was uh, was written because um, because I felt that you know even within the the women who love women community or the the lesbian slash bisexual community, there's a lot of uh, I guess racism, transphobia, biphobia, whatever, what have you, you know, uh, classism in there. And I wanted to expose it for, for what it was and uh, call it out. And I mean, the first, the why I started with that poem was because you guys at Art Science were like, yeah, you can do anything. It's a, it's a video. And, and for me, I think that that opportunity to kind of you know come out with a visual uh aspect to it and and i think that's that's what the pandemic has really done for my art is to be like yeah go do everything that you said you're gonna do but never did right and um i was talking about making it um i guess a uh, a visual piece for so long and i was you know like fantasizing oh you know it's gonna play on the background behind me as i read it out or whatever and you know so this was just an op opportunity to kind of like expand that even more and play with the aesthetics of code right um as a mm. very kind of masculine coded thing and juxtapose it with queerness like really queering the code right yeah um, you know, your, your work really attempts to shift the paradigm when it comes to um, identity po politics. And I remember telling you um, in, in our first kind of um, conversation about art science lead at home is that, um, you know, you make porous and fluid things that have been existing in certain bubbles like um, occult principles or parameters like poetic forms when you experiment exactly with, you know, post, post verbal language, um, like, you know, the C colon work. Um, and, and in his review of your book, um, Kai Chai also said that your intellect is grounded in the visceral response to issues rooted in the real world in your poems probe um, social norms on femininity, physical attract uh, physical attractiveness and taboo topics. Um, is I guess, is there a, a, a spe any specific reason why you gravitate towards um, this areas of inquiry? Mm, I guess I live in the body, so I feel frustrated in the body. I feel like dis disillusioned in the body, you know. So I I think that um because I see the way I mean as a relatively skinny less skinny now but relatively skinny Chinese pale girl that's gender conforming like you know um able body whatever i have so much privilege like, i've never been told my body's ugly ever right? ever um in fact i'm i'm like super comfortable in my body i will get naked for like any any reason at all but the fact is like i move in circles or i move in in relationships where that's not the case for a lot of people and that disconnect right even with um, even with fellow women, even with women who are kind of like to me coded the same way, like you know, like skinny Chinese uh, feminine, um, 
they don't have that same sense of of um, comfort and ease when they when they move through the world. And I, you know, it's it's always been sort of like a, a very um, a point of curiosity and um, frustration for me. Like why why don't you feel like you're allowed to exist? You know why why don't you feel like your body is a good body. I mean, for for people, some people, it's very clear because it's very systemic, right? Like, I'm fat. My doctors tell me I'm fat. I'm fat. Like, everything in my life is just um, rooted around, like, me being fat and everybody thinks that all the problems in my life are because I'm fat, you know? So, like, certain things like that, yeah, it's very clear and it's, it's so grounded. We don't even think about it when we say very casually fatphobic things or transphobic things or whatever. Um, and that's, that's a different kind of violence that I want to kind mm -hmm. of... Um, point uh, a light towards right um, so I think my my issue is that if everybody felt more comfortable to be ugly right like we didn't feel this pressure to be uh, attractive whether sexually or not all the time we would be a lot more free to do what we wanted you know instead of um, trying so hard to to police ourselves and other people and I guess I, I, I think that that empowerment belongs to everybody with a body, and they should be mm. able to access it. Hmm. Um, we've got a question coming in from an audience member. And before I talk about, before I flow that question to you, um, I think it's it's um, quite nice to ask you about how you've entirely undertaken the sort of production logistics. The performance, the editing of the visual and the audio materials for you know the films that you have done for Arts and Slate at home. Um, I mean, how how did the both of you kind of approach the A to Z of this entire process? Why do you even think about doing this in the first place? You know, and how was the experience for you kind of producing this um, particular piece? Clearly, you're not like sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> we clearly like being sleep deprived. <laughs> uh, um, Nat, Nat texted me today and she was like, I am a masochist. And I was like, Yes, she said that in the intro as well. Big mood. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I just asked you guys if you can career me a phone stand so I could film it myself. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just I re for for me I wanted if I really had like, you know, like the proper editing skills, the director eye and everything, there's a lot that I wish I could have done in terms of um I think I got the mood of what I wanted in terms of like just finality, right? Like um um small things. I'm very glad I got to include like the very last sausage in my fridge in the cooking process. <laughs> uh, uh like like yeah, but like I wish the I own I wish my video had longer moments of this kind of like symbolism wrapped up in, in banality, but I and do mm. not have the kind of skill or um I to be able to do because visual arts is um but uh I just tried to treat this as the project where I was doing something that I would not normally do sort of like what Marilyn said like if if like I, I think a big reason why I pivoted to this poem also was that because I wrote it in April um I was like uh, I can't I this poem cannot exist in any other form I'm never going to read it in an open mic anywhere it just doesn't work as an open mic piece, like a very specific angry woman open mic voice. Um, it is not something I will ever submit to a journal anywhere. So I was like, okay, I wrote it for Singapore Rimo. I'm just going to let it sit there and it was never going to see the light of day again. But like, I really wanted to do something that, that had to do with um, COVID, I guess, and how how COVID's affected um, mm -hmm. your ability to speak to people or your ability, or, or I think it made me reevaluate a lot of relationships with the way um, so many people are rushing back home. And now lots of people are stuck here or stuck in another country where um, family members or friends are uh, sick or dying or have died and they, they can't go to the funeral, they can't do anything as a kind of um, inability to communicate uh, uh, sometimes, I think, was also something I wanted to so um, and I thought that the only way this poem could work would, would be if it if it if it had visuals as well. Um, yeah. So I that is what I tried. That is what I tried. And, and the visual direction of the piece as well. It 
um, speaks in such a poignant way to what you were talking about, you know, days being loose and things just blending into, you know, each other. Oh, yeah. and, have, and, have, and that, that yeah. sense of time getting stretched and sometimes you losing um, where things are as well. Um, there's a comment from um, Vipula who says, great camera angle, Natalie. Mm -hmm. um, and she's wondering whether you put your laptop onto the books that we see in your video poem. Was that what yes, happened? Yes. Yes, yes, because um, I, I did a webinar for work and I was told the camera angle was bad, so I stacked a bunch of books and I, I'm just not going to get a proper desk stand. I'm just going to keep using my books. Right. Um, um, Marilyn, I have to say, I mean, the... Um, I mean, your your work came in as the final piece and, you know, the puzzle. Um, yeah, and that was yeah. really exciting to see because I, I think it's very reflective of... Um, the very multi-dimensional artistic trajectory that you were talking about and super excited to see where you're taking your practice. But could you just lift the curtain a little bit on, you know, how you put everything together? It feels like a massively kind of um, produced um, piece in terms of set design, in terms of props, in terms of video editing, in terms of sound editing. Like, how did this all happen? Um. Okay, so I think my, oh, it got, it got way too ambitious, right? So I started out thinking, hey, you know, what would be cool if, if it, it would be cool if I did like a, a poetry video, like a music video, but with other music, you know? And then it kind of like devolved from there to become <laughs> this thing like, how do I make a poem? a poem that's visual and not poem. And I was like, okay, but I can't like do it literally. So I have to like take the metaphor and then metaphorize it some more, you know? So it, it became this huge, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't entirely a huge undertaking, but I did feel very under-equipped to do it because uh, I think initially I asked everybody, like I asked uh, Sin and Simone at uh, Art Science Museum. Uh, Simone's our, our very wonderful tech. Uh, yeah, person. producer. And, yeah, no, a producer. Yes, sorry, I don't know the word for it. But um, <laughs> she, you know, she was like, "Okay, I'll give you a mic." And then I was like, "Oh no, do you have like lights and like a studio or whatever?" And and she didn't. So I was like, "Okay, fine, we're gonna lo-fi this thing." So, um, what happened was because I I like to do um I guess for lack of a better word like home photo shoots, right? So I already have a lot of black cloth and. You know, once you have black cloth in your house, you start thinking that anything is possible. So <laughs> I'm also a huge fan of like really macro shots. And and um, I mean, as you can tell, I'm very obsessed with hands, with like body parts, with uh, the visceral, like flowers, that kind of thing. So like they were, these are all really easy to get, right? If, I mean, if you, you can stand the smell of dead fish, which my girlfriend can't. And, you know, she was like, please don't have me in the room while you're filming this. I cannot do it. Um, but luckily I also have, have a, a, a girlfriend who is a photographer and she had a camera and so basically that's all you kind of need to think that oh you know maybe this is possible and I didn't sleep for three days because I was like okay I'm gonna storyboard this I'm gonna I'm gonna have this shot here and and I I I got all the shots that I wanted but a lot of them were like mm, this is this is not the way I thought it would go right like the so there's a shot that like um my hair is coming down to my face because it implies like, you know, a, a ghost is sort of like harassing me. Um, and the first time we did it, uh, my my poor videographer kind of like smacked me across the face in the wig. And I was like, no, no, that's not the way it goes. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of, um, it was very fun to do, but also very tedious, which is, I think, um, different from the way a lot of my work uh tends to play out because i mean as i mentioned i'm a very lazy person so like i don't like doing things where i have to i guess um put in effort that doesn't really translate into results but uh i think i i got a little bit tortured by my artistic vision for this one so i was just like <laughs> you know it was like Yo, you have thanks Thank you. But yeah, I it's it's also been something that I've been wanting to do for a while now and I've been thinking about doing, but I always put off because, you know, I was like, oh, I don't have the proper lighting and I don't have like the proper space to do it. Um, and I am truly very unhappy with uh, the way a lot of the shots came out. Uh, I will admit to that now and only now, but um, I think overall, this was like, this was a really good opportunity for 
uh, for me to kind of experiment with forcing myself into the, the realm of video production because poetry videos have been done before, right? Like, I mean, uh, Subash does some really good ones and, and Deborah Emanuel and so on and so forth. Uh, but I guess it's the same thing, right? They, they weren't the kind of thing that I wanted to produce. And uh, I guess you've kind of um, unleashed the demon. So, you know, maybe we will, we'll start doing more of these things now. Okay. So speaking about performance um, being a very tactile process, um, I'm very interested to ask you about that, Natalie. How did you feel when you were um, shooting this particular project versus, you know, say when um, art practitioners like Deborah Emanuel or um, FD drew on your material for their performances? I'm deeply under-equipped. <laughs> Like as a because I am a huge perfectionist, I never went into, um, like for years people were like, oh, you should start a like YouTube channel and like talk about makeup and stuff like that. I'm like, I have the skills for the at that point, I had the skills for the makeup. I didn't have the ability to where people were like, oh, you need to get a ring light, you need to get this kind of a camera, and then you need to be able. To, but I was just like, like it will never be the production quality that I want it to be, and especially because with makeup, like you need that faithfulness to color um, um so i was like i'm not even gonna bother trying so um yeah i just i just i just felt very very under equipped this entire time and then when marilyn and tanya did their thing i was just like ah, <laughs> uh, why are they so good and then um and and then i have my thing and um i mean I, i'm trying not to beat myself up about it i was pleased when um you and marilyn said that you liked it so i'm like okay that's all i need yeah, to but Yours was really good yeah. too, Nat. Like I cried, you know. It, it, it doesn't have, it doesn't have, like it totally like it doesn't have like you know I don't do drama anymore. I don't have the voice modulation. It felt very weird recording this. I can't really read, read. I can't actually no. I can still I think emote when I'm reading other people's writing. I don't know why I can't emote when I'm reading my own writing. I think I'm scared of feelings. Um, and then um, um. Real and then yeah, so it, it, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't it, does, it doesn't you know like the, the sound is just not as good. I want it to be the visuals are not as great as I want it to be, but I I tried I, I tried. share Marilyn's yeah. sentiments. I think it's it's such an authentic piece of work. Um and and you know, all the sort of insecurities you mentioned about the production aspects of, of the video, I think um maybe somehow that kind of plays into how we experience it as well. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's really powerful when, when you see something um, that is as honest and, and authentic like that, when you are clearly just improvising with whatever equipment you have at what home. I have. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and so we've been talking a lot about um, your, your first um, collections of poetry. And, and I would really love to talk about the books because um, those are my entry points into your practices as well. Um, and first books are especially significant and um, extremely delicate projects. Oh. Um, I'm wondering like when, when did the both of you start thinking about the possibility of assembling and publishing a full length collection? Oh my God, it was five years ago. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. Now I feel old. Okay. Just, we are old. We're getting older. Um. Yeah, you go first. Oh, okay. Um. Yeah. Five five years ago, twenty fifteen, I was offered um the option to pursue a Eureka, which is an undergraduate research project on on campus in NQ. Uh, and at first I was gonna be like, oh yeah, I'm pretty intellectual. I'll, I'll do like an academic project and blah blah blah. And then the minute I met Davia Victor, I was like, okay, yeah, psych, I'm gonna do, <laughs> I'm gonna do a full length manuscript. <laughs> Because when am I ever going to get the chance to do this with um, instruction and guidance and mm. also actual time, um, I guess, allocated for it, you know? And I think that being able to allocate time to write is such a huge privilege that, like, I, I miss it so much and I don't ever see myself, you know, being able to write like that if I have a full-time job. So maybe that's also why I'm kind of slightly unemployed right now but um we'll, we'll get there we will get there capitalism will not defeat us what about you natalie uh for me it 
was 2017. Uh, I I think I think I put oh yes, I put together something. Just I think like in March, like something like my 30 best poems. And I was thinking of submitting it for uh, Singlet Station's manuscript bootcamp that time. And then I passed it to somebody to look at it and everything got thrown out. And then I was like, no, I cannot do the poetry thing anymore. And I think it was a year. I think I only participated like four days in Singapore. I'm only the whole month because I was really like, I cannot poetry anymore. But that was good because that was actually when I started going back to prose poem. And I started uh, prose poems and I started really reflecting um, about what can I write or what can I contribute to the Singaporean poetry writing scene that mm. the average, um, I don't know, the, the average male order Chinese girl um, it, is able to, <laughs> yeah, yeah um, that is not able to do, right? Like, because at that point, as I said, I was writing a lot of breakup poetry and um, it was getting very, it was getting very stale. Yeah, it was getting very stale. So that was the shock that I needed, I think. Because that was when I was like, oh, what am I, what can I, what, what, what specific experience it would be like? Oh, um, I read a lot of ghost stories growing up and I want to write more about that. Or I read a lot about, I, everyone, I think, I think a lot of people have done the fairy tale genre to death, right? Like Margaret mm -hmm. Atwood and Carter. Um, and it's very, very hard to write anything as good as like Neil Gaiman's um, Snow Glass and Apples. But um but like I was like, oh, okay, let's do this with like half remembered Chinese folk tales that I know of, and I am a terrible, I am shit at Chinese, but like somehow managed to be able to do with like preliminary research and that kind of thing. So or or um, I think like my Pontianak poem still remains, I think, one of my favorites, if only because um, um, like members of like the Muslim community have. Um, been surprised that a Chinese girl wrote that poem and that one specifically is like very dear to me in terms of um, my research and I guess relationship with religion um, yeah then so so then that was all put together uh, I went to um, Kenny at books actually and was like would you be okay publishing this and he said yes and then I started passing it to to read and I was like oh can I get Alvin Pang for example to blub it or Ong Yisheng to blub it or Jennifer Ann Champion to blub it and then um, people came back to me not just with blubs but also with feedback and comments which was great and Alvin was like I'm not gonna blub this but you need a strict teacher as your editor I was like oh okay and then that was then in the end Kenny was like let's get Tanya do it so Tanya's my editor and like the book would look very different because I didn't cut out poems so much as I reshuffled everything so the flow is very different and then I owe a lot also to my writing group for for helping me with that process at that point in time so I was previously in Atom um, but now I'm in another writing group Sabre which is full of very young hungry writers who are pushing me to remember to write yeah I um when when I was sitting with the book I very much feel like um, it kind of shows us how it feels like to move through the world as a woman as well. Um, and the, the tension and the tangents between um, the myth and banality, um, it's, it's something that we, we don't come across um, that often in Singapore literature. So yes, I mean, that, that book is it's very dear to me as well. Um, I would just love to um, just still be on the topic of um, Talk, uh, strangeness and, and displacement since we're talking about it a little. Um, I'm wondering like how have you both been doing during this period? Um, you know, the, the sort of um, the hardest part of the pandemic, um, what, is the, what has it been like for you? And um, what have you found to be the most difficult adjustment that you've had to make? Um, because Natalie, you were talking a, a little bit about that as well. Um, and it, it's something that we, we just love to talk to our artists about because it's just a moment for everyone to just hold hands across the universe and yeah. Mm -hmm. I would hold the feet, but I can't lift my foot up. <laughs> um, honestly, the pandemic has been the least of it. <laughs> like, like uh, this is kind of messed up to say, but it's not um like yeah sure you know staying was hard cabin fever was hard because 
I was in a one room studio flat with like my partner and uh, we both kind of were constantly at each other's throats and you know like um, constantly worried because you know she's immunocompromised as well blah 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 um, but you know I think that the I think that the more banal questions of, you know, like, oh, where are we going to live? Because our, our landlord also said that, you know, like, um, he's going to sell the house, for example. And, you know, um, oh, not having a stable job or, you know, having personal inter interpersonal issues uh, that give me a lot of grief um, kind of made the entire pandemic seem huge and insignificant at the same time so like that's why i really resonated with natalie's um poem where she said you know like how how dare you be heartbroken like how dare how dare you find you know like uh this uh, any you know how dare you give this any weight because you know people are dying man people are dying and i was just like yeah but I've, i'm dying too in a, in a different way so um i think uh, there was a question that was posed to me a while back and they said, you know, how, what can you say about the importance of art in these pandemic times? And I was, I just felt like, listen, buddy, um, the only thing that's been stopping me from falling apart during this entire year has been making art and consuming other people's art, you know? That's it. That's literally it. So, um, yeah, don't go to therapy, but I really should. But, uh, yeah, that's that's been my twenty twenty new year <laughs> new boo. Yeah, Natalie. Yeah. Um, in some ways, I keep saying that I think twenty nineteen was a way worse year for me than twenty twenty. <laughs> mm. Like, um, like twenty nineteen, like work wise, was was a, an absolute nightmare. Uh, we so short staff. We were tired. I was doing so much OT. I have a three hour commute. I was in an hour and a half commute to work, which adds up three hours each time. Um, so work from home has been great because it means that I can take breaks during lunch to write or I, I my output this year has been ridiculous. Like I've never written yeah. so much in my life, even if it's just fan fiction, it's so much writing, right? Like I finished all 30 days of Singapore Poetry Writing Man for once. Um, and in many ways, like, in many ways, like, um, my mind is an experience that it's, I recognize it's like very hashtag blessed, very hashtag privileged. Um, I don't, I, I have moved out already from my parents, so I had a comfortable room to work in. I think I would be dead if I were still living, like, having to share a room and everyone's working from home. Um, uh, yeah, I, but, and and I, I don't find it very hard to stay in or to not meet people or anything like that. In fact, it's been I've been forcing myself to go out and I've been a lot more social this year than anything. Uh, again, very, very privileged, but I'm I'm healthy, I'm not mm. terribly afraid. My parents are okay, my family's okay. Um nobody I know has passed away or or anything, been been greatly affected. Mm. So I, mm. I feel so bad. I feel so bad talking about these things. Like, I don't have problems. Like these aren't problems. Like yeah, like that I'm... was. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. No. That 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 was that was nothing. Nothing else to that. Yeah. There was a question from Stephen um, who was asking how you think the panic of the pandemic affected your writing process. But I guess you know Stephen, you should have your answer. Um, yeah. By what yeah. Natalie and, and, and Marilyn yeah. have shared. Um, Maybe just um, extending Stephen's question as well. Um, has this period changed the way you think about writing and your work? Um, anything new that you discovered about yourself, your practice that you hadn't considered before? Hmm. I feel like I am less concerned now with whether or not the audience is having a good time. I feel like, you know, previously because- As long yeah, as you are. Yeah, as long as I am, like, you know, yeah. screw all of you. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> no, it's more like, um, how do I put this? I, I, I grappled a lot with this when I was a spoken word poet, and I, I think I still am, like, no, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, because of the immediate feedback you get yeah. from the audience, yeah. the, the tendency or the instinct is to go for the cheap shot or to go for the joke that you know will get the most laughs, you know? And... Um, Maybe I should have been a stand-up comedy instead. But, you know, it's uh, writing in sol solitude, right, is something that I haven't thought about for a very, very long time. And 
I haven't, uh, I guess, for me to sit with my poetry and just write from a place of yearning or grief or pain or frustration has been quite, I guess, liberating for me to see people actually accepting these poems and enjoying them, like after the fact, you know, because I, uh, like, like Natalie, I finished all 30 days of Singapore Raimo and then I just continued. So like I, I have about 60 poems from Singapore Raimo and like, I don't know what to do with them, you know, and, and some of them are garbage, they're, they're genuinely garbage, but some of them I, I genuinely like. And um, it's quite heartening for me to see somebody enjoy a work that I haven't written a thesis about in my head, you know, because like all of all of the poems in Gaze Back have sort of like little, little thesis for for them. They, you know, like they're about blah, 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 you know, and um, they, it's very, it was very much an intellectual exercise. But this was kind of going back towards uh, the viscerality or the, the granular feeling of poetry that first led me to it in the first place. And I'm quite grateful that um, that we discovered that. And Natalie, what about you? I have totally forgotten the question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, I was asking if, if um, you know, the, the sort of pandemic has changed the way you think about um, right. your work. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 You discovered about your, yourself or your practice. Um, I've discovered that I can actually, I religiously produce something like three to 5,000 words every week until not like for three months straight because I was posting a chapter okay like I, I mean I think I think at this point like I'm very shocked at my output and my ability to write things under pressure but mm. um um as long as I know where the plot is and where my story is going um I I think now I'm trying to care a lot less about getting published within journals, which is my concern a couple of years back when you're still publishing within the scene or anything. Like right mm -hmm. now, I just want to write what I enjoy. Um, I think for me, this year specifically, I went back into, as I said, I've been saying since that time, fan fiction writing and going back to fandoms in general. And like, basically it's been so wonderful going back to a community of people who care about the same questions. And then um, they, they, sorry, they take care about the same characters and everything and who are excited to see what you write. Like that kind of a support is difficult, I think, to get outside of fandoms because, you know, it's very hard to get interested in somebody's like unpublished novel, for example. But like here, the source material is there and we'll just be happy to read and happy to comment and happy to share. And like that that kind of community, I think, I, I, I remember at one point I was like, oh my God, someone wrote a 500 word essay about how much they love my my um like what i have written so far like I, this is better than any kind of like book review or um you know critical review or anything that, that a, a reputable journal can do because there's just so much joy from that mm -hmm. and i think um um yeah i used to stress a lot about uh reputability about being published and that kind of thing but like now i think this year like just going back to writing for the sake of loving writing and not necessarily having to care about that. I mean, I still take care about things like pacing, uh, quality, grammar, and that kind of thing. But like, I'm less stressed about this now. Because there is, yeah, that 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 yeah, that sharing of that. Um, I'd love to close the program um, with this last question because we don't have a lot of time. But I'd love to ask you about your plans for the near future. Is there anything in the works or something that you hope will land on the page? Um, or, you know, what are you hoping to do when, you, when we do come out on the other side of the pandemic? Go to karaoke. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, I miss Teo Heng. Um, oh my God. Teo Heng, I love Teo Heng so much. At least we know they'll survive, right? The alternative business model is fantastic. Um, no, but yeah. Yeah, um, I had a very smart answer to that, but I've completely forgotten Sorry. what it was. <laughs> um, okay, ask her again. What will you do when we come on the other side of the of the pandemic? No, there was a meme somewhere that I just sent to my writing group and everyone flipped out and yelled at me because it was like, writers will do this thing where they're like, I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to write because if I do, it'll stress me out and I'm not going to do it. Or I'm going to tell you everything about what I'm going to do, but I'm not going to do it either. 
and I'm just like I feel so upset if I tell me like I'm gonna do a, a novel it's not gonna happen I tell I've been telling people I'm gonna do a second manuscript for years it's not gonna it's not I've not touched it at all <laughs> yeah um yeah. so I think for me personally I've got no plans I but generally you know, like sorry. sorry sorry go ahead go ahead Sin. sorry I was... um, no, I was going to tell Natalie that, you know, you, you are a co-host of the Facebook event page. So if you do make a decision on on whether or not, you know, you want to share your plans at a later date, please feel free to, you know, just, just share with us on that page. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, by yeah, the way, Marianne, everybody, sorry, I'm yes. going to become the next Russell Lee. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I generally lie and say I don't have anything planned because it, it does it does stress me out. But not, not so much stressed out as I feel like I'm making a promise that I'm not going to keep further down the line anyway. So, like, why why bother? You know, why why bother telling you? But, um, I mean, as you have seen, like, I, I have already started delving into other media. So, <laughs> like, uh, I could continue with that, I suppose. There's a question from Tyler's Maestro. And he's like, any plans to connect your works through music and songwriting? Hashtag oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And Thanks I'm like, yes. Please, if you are an indie musician, or if, if you're a not, what's the opposite of an indie musician? A mainstream musician, I don't know. Um, a, an in, an acid jazz musician. Please let let's let's collaborate. I'm very promiscuous, and I love to talk shop. Yeah. Um. No lah. I think that it's it's important um to kind of make poetry, uh, this transcendent and fun thing again because I feel like especially in academic circles, it takes itself way too seriously. And uh, it becomes a circle jerk where everybody is like, oh, you know, like, let's just hop up with like the big names and, you know, try to aspire to get up there. And it's, it's just messed up, you know, it's like a hierarchy of who's who at some point. And I, I don't want it to go, I don't want highbrow art and lowbrow art to have a distinction. I want it all to be a unibrow of art. That's what I want. Wow, and on that note, I, I can't think of a better way to just wrap up um, the conversation today. Um, again, Natalie, thank you for sculpting this very quiet, um, moving piece of work, um, dear love, to share with us. And, and Marilyn, you know, for the gloriously resilient voice in your triptych, um, we love it. And um, we really appreciate both of you making time to take part in what has been such a lovely Q&A and conversation. Um, and a huge thank you to all of you, our viewers, who have been sitting with us at Art Science Late at home this evening and listening in. We, we love having you join us and, you know, receiving your questions and, and your comments and hellos um, throughout the evening. So in addition to the works presented by Marilyn, Natalie and Tanya for Art Science Late at Home, you can stay up to date with everything that's happening on site at the museum and on our online content platforms, such as, you know, the other programs organized as part of the Women of Art and Science season via our website, Facebook page and YouTube channel. Um, and um, I just really love to say that this year has um, just called for new ways of being in the world and we are so so grateful for the extraordinary community of artists around us um, collaborators like ethos books and books actually who um, supported the work that we are doing with um, you know our artists for this iteration of the performance program and and all of you who have been such a wonderful part of the art science late story this is a body of work that has been especially close to our hearts. And I wanted to also acknowledge my teammates, um, Stacey, Simone and Lyra, who have been choreographing various moving parts of this monthly events behind the scenes, who are amazing, uncompromising women in their own right. So we can't wait to return with Art Science Late in 2021. And until then, we hope you stay safe and healthy. Marilyn and Natalie, thank you so much again. It's been completely wonderful to be able to bring you both into the fold of our work and share your practice with the thank community. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank we you wish you all for, the best. for being such an amazing moderator and you know for making it such a seamless experience and and you know for being so thoughtful and considerate. All the support and, as well, like yeah. the production and everything. It's been Correct. Really yeah. wonderful. Yeah. It was super working with you guys. And also Simone, like, thank you, Simone, for all the technical support. Yeah. Love um, yes, yeah, so love all around. Thank yous all around. We hope you have a good night and um, have a good end to the week. And um, we hope to see all of you very soon.